This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. Evening, everyone. Um, so we are here to talk about get going, version your code like it's 2013. Um, can everyone hear me OK? Let actually be a little bit loud now that I'm hearing myself. Um, everyone still able to hear me in the back? Cool. All right. So. My name is Cadam White. I am a developer at a company in town called Boku. We do um, open source front end web application development. And I, since December, have been one of the co organizers of the Boston WordPress Meetup group. Um, and we are here to talk about Git specifically. Um, version control in gen general, GitHub sort of extra specifically, but mainly Git. Um, before we get started, I'm sort of curious to learn a little bit about. Who's in the audience? Who um, is a primarily a developer? So almost everyone. Awesome. I guess this was sort of a developer-oriented day. And who is actively using a version control system right now? Good. Who's using Git? Smaller number, but still a lot. All right, so I'm going to buzz through a lot of the sort of higher level material. Um, the main goal of my talk is to sort of explain how Git interrelates with platforms like GitHub and its ilk and sort of, in general, how you can think about using those tools in your development workflow as you're building um, tools and products, both open source and non. Um, man, people are tweeting at me a lot. So version control, as everyone that raised their hands is aware, is a way to save your code over time. Um, sort of a step above saving out different versions of your uh, Microsoft Word document, um, rather than just saving drafts, you can actually uh, keep track of individual additions and subtractions of code or any sort of text um, on a time basis so that you can say, what did our code look like on December 22nd? What did our code look like last June? And actually get back to exactly the state of your code base and of your server at that time which lets you keep much better track of um, when bugs might have originated and also um, what you might have been thinking when you were working on a feature. Um, traditional version control systems were a pretty centralized affair. You would actually check out the code that you were going to work on, make your changes, check it back in, um, sort of an early attempt at um, making it easier for large groups of people to work on the same project was around how do we minimize the number of conflicts so that I'm not working on the same file that someone else is working on at the same time. Um, there was a really popular uh, couple, CVS, SVN is actually what WordPress uses, the SVN project. Um, and eventually, these tools, um, for people that were running large-scale distributed projects, they began to feel a little limited by them. Um, the concept of distributed version control uh, arose, as far as I'm aware, in the sort of mid-late 90s. And the difference of paradigm was that everyone had their own copy of the code. It's not just that you have um, one centralized, true repository at all times. There's nothing that makes my repository any better or worse than the one that's on something like GitHub. It's just the fact that we've designated that one as the centralized main repository by convention, um, sort of a peer-to-peer -peer approach versus the more client-server approach of something like CVS and SVN. Uh, actually, both Mercurial and Git were started in response to a previous tool called BitKeeper, which was actually what was being um, somewhat controversially used to manage the Linux kernel um, in the late 90s, but then was uh, pulled from that project due to licensing restrictions. Um, so tools like Mercurial and Git sprung up as a response to uh, the lack of a good distributed ver uh, version control system. Um, Git specifically was designed by Linus Torvalds of Linux fame um, to manage, well, for example, the Linux kernel. Um, it was the project that had hundreds and hundreds of people working on it all over the world very concurrently. Um, it just wasn't, there wasn't an existing version control system that was able to handle what he wanted to do, or at least that he was allowed to use because of the falling out with BitKeeper. Um, Git was designed at least partially to be everything that CVS was explicitly not. Um, so it's a good example of a tool that was designed directly towards the failings of another option. 
Um, but it's been around for eight years, and recently it's really exploded over the past half decade. Um, if you're obviously, there's a lot of you that are using it. This is old news. Everyone's on Git right now. A ton of these projects, um, basically, if you're in front end web development, you've run across or have used on a daily basis at least three or four projects that are primarily um, developed with Git, if not almost everything in your tool chain. Uh, jQuery, Node.js, Vagrant, which is a really awesome uh, virtual machine provisioning system that you can use to do local WordPress development. Um, Bootstrap, the design framework, all of the front end JavaScript application development frameworks, underscores, um, ton of the WordPress starter themes and general WordPress themes and plugins in general. It's a little repetitive, sorry. Um, the number of, I don't, I don't have a solid stat for how many plugins in the WordPress repository are developed using Git and then moved over to SVN, but I know that that number is going up. This has got tons of adoption, and that's sort of because Git, in addition to being um, very distributed and very democratic in how it lets you manage your code, it's very lightweight. Actually starting a repo um, is, once you have it installed, about as easy as it can be with a version control system. So uh, actually just going to do this live with my slides while we do this. Git init, you have a, rep you have a repo now. Add some files. Commit your changes. Boom. Then if you realize, for example, that you've misspelled your in the title of your slide, it's really a simple matter to go in and see exactly what changes have been made since the last time you checked in. In this case, we're going to add those, we're going to add that file back. And now we have an up-to-date repository with the latest changes from our code. So oh, I haven't actually mirrored the changes, whatever. I could theoretically. There we go. Um, so in addition, uh, Git gives you a lot of really powerful tools for manipulating and viewing the history of the project. Again, not necessarily a new concept in terms of version control in general, but I like the tool set that they provide. You can just type git log and see, in this case, a very boring set of commits, but um, it's possible to use options like the graph option, and um, there's a ton of command line parameters that all of these utilities take that let you create actually pretty readable in-console representations of your project history, which can be useful if you're working particularly on a remote server and don't have access to a GUI tool in order to do this. Um, but that does bring up the question of the command line. Obviously, there's a lot of developers in the room, but even if you're a developer, this was a phrase that got said a lot at WordCamps and conferences I was at last year, that the command line isn't scary because Photoshop has over 300 buttons and that's scary. I think that's sort of a false guide because at least in Photoshop, there is a button that does exactly what you want, or at least close to. Um, the command line is legitimately scary to a lot of people because there's no guidance for what you want to do. Autocomplete only gets you so far. If you're just like looking at a command prompt, it's, like, it's a lot easier to go down and just do a Mad Libs than it is to do a novel on your first try. Um, the good news is that there's also a ton of GUI tools that will support Git. A lot of them are inspired by some of the previous, like there's Tower Git. Um, Tower, I believe, uh, previously had SVN support as well. A lot of these are related to existing very well proven um, source control front ends tools that will let you visualize your changes. Um, I happen to use one called SourceTree. Um, Git extensions on Windows is very solid, and GitHub has actually released their own uh, GUI tools for both Mac and Windows um, that sort of do a lot to simplify the rough edges of Git and make it uh, work in a pretty intuitive way, particularly for people that are fairly new to it. So if you're a little bit overwhelmed by the command line or some of the existing uh, GUI tools, I strongly encourage you to check out something like GitHub's applications. Um, it's incredibly easy to get started with them. If you're actually browsing a Git repository, you can just click the clone and Mac button and it'll prompt you to download it if you haven't already installed that application. So they really walk you through the process of getting up and going with these tools. <clears throat> 
So the reason to know the command line is that it does let you sort of understand how the advanced stuff works and what the power of the tool is. Um, eventually, there comes a time where no matter how good your GUI tool is, it's not going to necessarily provide exactly the right command for you to handle the way you need to in the moment. So there is a definitive book on this. Pro Git is a book that is available for free online through the Git homepage website. And they walk through basically everything. Actually, I think I can say literally everything that's possible using Git. But um, additionally, there's a couple sort of high-level commands that I wanted to flag just because they're super useful and they're not necessarily common knowledge. First of them would be the concept of a Git submodule. If you're working on a project, chances are you're including dependencies from other libraries. Like a lot of us would be using jQuery. A lot of us might be building a project that includes WordPress in one folder and some other application components that interact with it elsewhere. If you don't want to commit like a particular version of jQuery and a particular version of underscore, well, that all should be built into WordPress anyway, but if you're building a tool that uses a smaller subset of things and you don't want to have to maintain all of those files, you can actually use a git submodule to point your repository at essentially a child repository that will let you manage all of those, just let them take care of upgrading and all of that, and the only thing you have to do is change when you want to point at a new version. The syntax is really simple. We're actually going to use it right now and include a submodule for the reveal.js plugin into the repository that I'm building for my slides here. And what that does is it clones that repository within the directory that you're currently in, but if you go to do your git status, the only files that are new are the directory, which is essentially treated as a flat file, and to git modules hidden file that points you to a particular path in a particular URL. So um, this is a really nice tool if you're working on very large projects just in order to minimize the amount of stuff you actually have to care about in your repository. As we'll mention later on, the smaller your repository, the faster all of the git commands are going to run. So now that we've done that, let's go ahead. And we'll commit that as well. Rebasing is another um, really useful Git feature. It's actually possible because everything's distributed. Um, you have the complete ability to work in an isolated local environment as long as you want before you push your changes up to a server. A lot of us, as we're developing, will make a series of very small incremental commits. Like, you know, maybe I misnamed this variable. I'll commit that just so that I don't have to go back too far if I need to roll back any changes. That stuff over time can be confusing if you're looking at it in a repository. If you're looking at one of those branch diagrams where it says like this commit, this commit, suddenly you have a ton of tiny little commits in there that don't really do anything. Rebasing is sort of two things it does. Um, one is it lets you keep your working copy separate from what you're pulling down. So that is not what that's supposed to look like. I could do a rebasing live demo here, but I'm not going to because I'm not that brave. <laughs> there we go. Um, so the two things that it mainly does is that you can actually do what's called a pull rebase, which means if, I have, if I'm working on my repository and I've made change A, B, and C, and someone else on uh, the shared repository has done D, E, and F, I can actually pull so that A, B, and C goes to the end and actually has no interaction with everything else that's been put onto that repository since the last time I synced, so that it continues to be isolated. It continue, it's sort of hard to visualize. I should have a diagram, but um, Git pull rebase is a really useful tool for keeping your changes separate from what's going on on the remote, which is the term for um, someone else's Git repository that's linked to yours. And again, um, the other thing that it does is that it lets you take all of those tiny little commits that we discussed and squash them down so that if you've made you know, five incremental small changes all related to one patch, you can rebase to have that become one commit that just addresses that single patch. I know at least a couple companies where their guidelines for using Git are that one commit, one patch. Um, that, sorry, one commit, one issue, essentially. Each commit resolves a very specific ticket. And one commit means one ticket, and one ticket means one commit. So it helps them figure out exactly where things happen in your repository. So 
The danger with rebasing is that because you are messing with the timeline of history um, in a very science fiction movie sense, you can really mess things up if you do it wrong. So uh, Linus Torvalds himself cautions against doing this too much because it is, there is a distinct chance that if you go to too, uh, too great an extreme with the changes that you're rebasing, it will actually become harder to tell what you were working on. So it's usually a really good strategy for keeping your work separate from other work that's going on and for taking a bunch of very, very strongly related changes and squashing them down, but not for you know, re-envisioning the entire history of your project. And finally, the, um, probably the single most useful feature of Git when you're uh, trying to troubleshoot an issue is a tool called Git Bisect. Um, I have a coworker who has said that this tool makes him feel like a wizard. Basically, it lets you do a binary search through your repository history using the last known good state and your current bad state. So if I have a bug, if I know that my homepage doesn't load, but I knew that it loaded two weeks ago, I can say git bisect bad is current, good is two weeks ago. And it'll pick a commit one week ago and say, is it good or is it bad? If that's bad, it'll pick a commit a week and a half ago and say, how about now, until I figure out exactly where that bug was introduced. And then not only do I know what was changed that broke it, but there's an additional uh, correlated tool called git blame, which works very similar to SVM blame, where you can actually figure out which one of your teammates made the mistake. Always very fun. There's a ton of stuff in git. Going over the nitty gritty of actually using it, I think is out of scope for a 30 minute talk, but um, knowing sort of the high levels of what's out there is really useful because this is an incredibly powerful tool that you get better with the more you use it. Um, some of my coworkers say that it's uh, definitely a tool that's best learned with, with an expert within close IRC or IM range. I think that's true. But there are enough tutorials and books out there that if you're looking to start working on a project in Git, I say just get one of the um, Git frontends and give it a try. Um, take a look at the command line. See if your front end gives you the ability to view the commands that it's running as you click buttons. I know Git extensions actually will display a little window with the Git commands that it runs whenever you do things like check-ins and posts uh, and pushes and pulls so that you sort of get a little bit formul more familiar with the language that Git uses. The only downside to it is that is it is a tool designed by really, really hardcore programmers. So a lot of the um, things about it are not necessarily uh, what one might call obvious, but uh, once you learn kind of the way that they think and the way they talk, it's a fairly coherent system. The other thing that almost all of these have in common, not Linux, not a couple, but a lot of these projects are hosted on GitHub. And GitHub is gonna be the focus of the second half of this talk. Um, Git is not the same as GitHub. Uh, GitHub serves sort of the track to Git's SVN on a lot of projects. It provides project management and issue tracking and sort of auxiliary support around the Git version control system. But um, it does give you a lot of additional tools that are designed directly in response to the core functionality of Git. And using GitHub or one of its uh, competitors as a um, platform for running your projects can let you do some really, really awesome things um, in terms of developments and uh, collaborative programming. First thing it does, obviously, is code hosting. Um, GitHub is now the most popular code hosting site in the world. Um, basically, no one else that I was able to find numbers for comes close right now. But they also provide collaboration tools, um, some limited uh, issue tracking and task management. Um, they give you the ability to run wikis for each of your repos. And they happen to run all of these other things like SlideShare and Gists. And they have all sorts of like auxiliary projects that the folks that run github.com also contribute to and support that kind of tie into it to some extent. Less so SlideShare, more Gists. But um, it's an interesting sort of ecosystem that they've created. And it is taken off, particularly in my world in JavaScript, but also, you know, PHP, we're on here. and. Um, Particularly, uh, Ruby on Rails is what drives GitHub. Ruby's always been a powerful language with it, but these days, Objective C, C Sharp, there's a lot of other languages that have been picking up steam in this community too. I really don't know a community um, that doesn't have any notable projects on GitHub at this point. Um, and I actually took a sort of informal survey on Twitter over the weekend to try to find a major JavaScript project that wasn't on GitHub, and we basically couldn't find any. 
it was a little sad actually because that's sort of uh, right. I had it to do there. Um, it's. I feel like there should be more competition, but GitHub's just doing such a bloody good job. It's hard to really argue with their success. Um, some of the tools they provide collaboration. If you're working on something like jQuery, you don't want it to be at. I wouldn't want it to be at. Uh, you know, my repository. I wouldn't want the only copy of this that's authoritative to be a, a versus someone's personal repository. So, um, of course, there was a jQuery organization created to manage the jQuery project. So github.com slash jQuery isn't a person, it's a team of 58 people who all collaborate to drive this forward and who all have, um, you can designate different levels of rights and authorship within a team so that, you know, maybe uh, like these people, you want to be able to read and make updates to your documentation and your wikis. These people get full commit access, and like that dude can do something else. Um, it's possible to be pretty granular with your permissions so that you can give exactly the people that you want access, but you don't have folks um, that suddenly are able to access parts of your application that you didn't want them in. Like if you're working on GitHub, does offer the, the an interesting thing. Side note. Part of why GitHub has taken off within the open source community is that by default, all free accounts on GitHub can only host open source projects. If you make a repo on GitHub and you're not paying the money, that repo is available for the world to see. Other, other sites like Bitbucket, the niche that they've sort of carved out, Bitbucket's very similar to GitHub in many ways. It's run by Atlassian, At Atlassian I believe, uh, the company behind Jira. It does some different things because it lets you have free, uh, private repositories for free. So a lot of people will use things like Bitbucket for their client work and GitHub for their open source work. Um, sort of interesting seeing how the market's changed up. But even if you do have a private repository on GitHub, if you are paying them for the right to have a private team and a set of private repositories that the world can't access, you can specify some teams have access to some of those, but not others. That way, if you have contractors come in to help you with, say, the front end of your website, but you don't, you don't want to give them access to all of the back end SQL scripts and all of the internal uh, sort of uh, storefront, um, store management type applications you might be developing, it's possible to restrict access to a particular set of repositories. So collaboration through organizations is pretty straightforward. And um, if I mentioned earlier, like you might have people that are just writing documentation, they might be doing that right in GitHub itself. GitHub does for every repo, not only let you specify uh, teams and organizations that have access to that repo, but you can actually create a wiki that is specific to that particular piece of code. So um, this is something that can be set up on a per repository basis. And um, the wiki itself is actually driven by Git on top of something that uh, a wiki tool called Gollum. Um, it lets you write, who's familiar with the Markdown text format? Okay, I will change that because it's really good. Um, Markdown is a really, really useful uh, text markup format. It's actually what these slides are written in. Um, and it lets you just use a very, very simple text-based, um, almost wiki-like syntax for how you're uh, designating headers and links. Um, and even image inclusions so that you can write a plain text document that can be easily read, unlike, say, HTML, which clutters it up with all of those tags. Um, and it's not as powerful as HTML, but it'll let you write uh, very, very quickly. Um, and you can use this not only to drive GitHub uh, wiki articles, but also for any markdown file gets natively parsed by, Git, um, by GitHub, I'm sorry, when you uh, push it up to your repository. So we'll see an example of that in a little bit. But uh, Gollum supports a ton of different markup formats. You don't have to use that. It's just the emerging standard. And um, you can actually clone the wiki independently. So if you wanted a copy of, say, the wiki for AngularJS, which is a front-end JavaScript framework, you can actually go and git clone github.com slash angular slash angular.js.wiki.git. And then you have all of those markdown files um, right on your local computer for you to edit and take a look at as well. It's, not, it's mainly useful if you're migrating things to be able to bring it out as a wiki, but it's nice to know that all of the changes you're making to your wiki within GitHub are actually being backed up by a Git backend themselves. And then when you get into the really interesting and useful stuff for when you're working on projects. A lot of the big projects out there, um, Backbone, Underscore, use this very heavily. GitHub has a built-in issue tracker. 
the one that we're looking at right now is actually for the uh, style sheet preprocessor less. Um, but it's a way for people to report issues. It's a way to uh, stimulate discussion about the future of an open source library. And it gives you a lot of built-in tools for getting a little bit more out of this. Um, just from having a GitHub account, you can, if you're able to, if you're associated with an organization, people in that organization can assign you to a particular ticket. So that if you want someone on your team, like maybe you have one uh, really, really hardcore SQL person, you can just assign them all of the SQL tickets and you can take all of the JavaScript ones and your main PHP person can take those. It's a nice way to sort of divvy up the work and assign it so that there's a little bit more accountability. This is particularly useful when you're handling an internal project that's being hosted on Git rather than, say, a big project like Backbone or jQuery where really no one's going to be assigned until someone submits a pull request, which we'll get to in a second. But once it's been assigned, it can also be assigned to a milestone. So you can designate, you know, this is everything that we're agreeing to take in for uh, the next major release. You know, 3.6 for WordPress is coming up. You can do the exact same thing, say, this is in, this is out. This is backlog. These are things that we want to prioritize. These are things that we aren't really looking at right now. That makes it really, really easy for you to just go to the GitHub website for your particular repository and see exactly where you're at against your milestone targets. Um, in addition, within a milestone, once you've created a bunch of tickets, you can tag them with different um, flags and you can get as minimal or as verbose with this as you want. And that way um, you can actually see like, oh, this thing is a suggestion. This thing is a priority bug. This thing is something we cannot ship unless we fix. That way it'll help you further prioritize within the milestones if you're using the GitHub issue tracker. Not necessarily a replacement for something like Jira, but it's really nice that you get it essentially for free um, as part of the project that you're working on. And if you're working on something, um, particularly a distributed open source project, it's really nice to have a one-stop shop where people can go for the code and for any uh, list of issues that they can contribute to. The other cool thing about having it integrated is that as with many integrated version control and issue tracking systems, you can actually close commits directly from, uh, close tickets directly from commit messages. So you can do things like give it a uh, commit message that says fixes number, issue number somewhere in your string, and that will actually go and close that issue and give you back reference, a track back to the commit that you just pushed up so that it's really easy for people to browse through and say, when did this get closed? It got closed in this commit, I see. The next thing that GitHub provides that I think is probably the single most useful function of GitHub or Bitbucket or any version control system that has a good web interface is strong code review functionality. GitHub has something in particular called pull requests, but in general, um, they just give you a really good ability to add line-specific comments and start conversations right in the thread of your, um, the thread of your code. And if you have submitted um, essentially a feature that you want to see merged in, it is a really, really awesome way to get people's feedback on it and see what changes the community and the rep rep repository maintainers might want you to make in order to be able to bring that into your project. Um, a pull request is essentially uh, when you're working with remotes in Git, which is what they call it when you have multiple different people who each have a copy of the system, those are all remotes. And you can designate, um, I could have a remote pointing to you know, John or Kurt's computer. It doesn't have to be a centralized server, you just have to have an open network path to it. You can actually set up remotes in different directories on your home computer if you really want to. Um, but you interact between remotes, you synchronize between them using uh, the verbs fetch, pull, and push. And a pull request means you're taking changes from a remote into your repository. GitHub created the term pull request to mean uh, essentially a merge request for a change that you've made. I have gone to the trouble of making a fix for this issue that I've seen or this problem that I've found. Please review it and see whether you can bring it into your code base. The other thing that pull requests have begun to sort of communicate is actually more like a new feature ticket. There are some organizations, GitHub in particular, um, that's a link uh, to an article where they explain how they do this, where they actually open the pull request as soon as they've decided they're going to make a change. They might not have done any research or any code or any discovery yet, but they'll open it right there and then they'll have this huge thread um, about exactly how that's gonna get built out so this is a pull request thread 
something on the order of, of 120 commits um, over the course of several months across a number of different developers where they just sort of walk through um, all of the different changes and options and comps they have for the feature that they're developing. And then at the very end, they land all of the commits that they were working on and push it out through. It's a nice way to see the evolution of a feature. Um, doesn't work for all organizations. I've been places that use it this way and don't. But um, I love the pull request feature. It's something that is thankfully um, being liberally cribbed by everyone else in addition to GitHub. Um, Bitbucket, Gatorius, there's a lot of other um, competing Git-based web hosts that will let you do merge requests and let you do inline code review in the same way. And that is an awesome thing because it is the killer feature for this type of tool because it makes everything extremely visible, extremely public, and extremely easy for you to get feedback on your code from the people that you want to see it. Um, so in general, the open source workflow for contributing to a project tends to go something like find a repository that you want to contribute to, figure out what some of the issues are, create a copy of it locally, which is called forking that repository. Uh, one that's often overlooked is reading and understanding the project's contribution guidelines. WordPress has the WordPress core contributors handbook. jQuery has the jQuery contributors guide. Most projects have things they want you to do and want you to understand in order to be able to upstream your changes into them. But if you're looking to uh, work on an open source project, they will probably either have one of those, and if they don't, just ping the maintainer of the repository and say, hey, is there anything I should know about this? Because it just makes things a lot easier down the road when you make changes and finally submit a request. If you know what format they want things in, this is most likely to lead to good conversation in number five and not, oh, hey, you need to change to using semicolons or a different type of white space, which can always be really, really irritating to people who struggle about that stuff. And then finally, at the end, repo maintainer merges your pull request and you have contributed to a project on GitHub. But if you're working on something on your own, slightly different. Basically, you just create a repository on your own GitHub account, add that repository to your local as a remote, and push your changes up. So we're going to make one call here, git going, and on git at Boston. It's going to be public. And because I've already got code, I'm not going to initialize a readme or anything. I'll explain sort of how readmes play into all of this in a minute. Um, GitHub's really nice because it actually gives you instructions for exactly what to do next. Uh, basically, you go to your repository. Yes. You run a command, and now you actually have what's called a remote, which is a pointer to the repository up on GitHub. So I can just go ahead and run the commands that they told me to run. And now, if I refresh this page, now my code is up on GitHub. So yeah, these slides are going to be on GitHub. They are there right now. Um, the other, uh, see. the other nice thing that you can do is that once you have code, if it is something like this that, yep, five minutes, shoot, okay, we're gonna fly. Um, if, you have, <laughs> if you have code that you want to be, um, like you might want to have a homepage for your project and you might not want it to be hosted on some other random website, so you can actually, um, Right, it's gone. There's actually this concept that Git has where you have a GH pages branch, and that gives you the ability to access it off of github.io slash repo name um, so that you can basically either use a pre-built te theme template or use a static site generator like Jekyll or just push up raw HTML and have that hosted directly within the same repository as the project for which the web page exists. Um, nice way to sort of keep things together. Demo is what I just did. I'll show it to you in a second if it worked. And um, we're just going to talk real fast about a couple additional features and some best practices. Gist's final main feature that the GitHub ecosystem provides, it gives you the ability to post a very small snippet of code that um, can let you, you know, take notes, save useful scripts, show something that you might want to send to someone for review. Um, it's just like a paste bin thing. It happens to be associated with GitHub, so it's gotten a lot of traction, and it's, it's nice to know about it. 
does things like inline mark, markdown processing. Um, and now we're going to talk some about best practices for Git. Branching strategies is a trick for most version control systems. Git encourages you to branch often. Uh, basically, if you are working on a new feature, you generally want to create a branch for it. Git really encourages you to make branches and to merge them sort of on an ongoing constant basis. Um, you can maintain your repository however you want, but some people go to the extent of having, at any given time, seven or eight active development branches where they'll be working on their code. Um, this is one that gets a lot of press. Uh, it was contentious enough that people essentially forked the branching model and have their own version now. So it's really just going to be personal preference. What most people end up doing is they have a main trunk development branch that is separate from their master. Master ends up uh, corresponding to the production ready version of their code. And then whenever they want to create a feature, they branch off of their trunk, merge it back in, and then as they get ready to do a release, then they'll merge to master. And um, ProGit sort of does a really good job of walking through sort of how a bunch of people do this. You do end up having merge conflicts, so it's a good idea to get familiar with a good merge tool. Um, most of you probably have a favorite one already. Um, and oh, that's where that slide went. Um, and just sort of general branch etiquette, not only should you create new features on new branches, but once you've merged something, it's generally a good idea to clean up after yourself and delete those branches. Git is nice, GitHub is nice because it lets you just click a button once you've pulled in a merge request and it cleans up that extra branch right there. Yeah, pull requests can be used within one repository from a branch to another, in addition from one fork of a repository to another, which is nice because it lets you use that uh, pull request style of code review on an internal project without having to have different um, GitHub accounts. Um, Naming conventions, always a useful thing. A lot, most people that I've seen have something to the effect of uh, type of branch, issue tracker number, short readable description. Again, it just works for you. I encourage you to keep it consistent. Commit messages is another thing that people get very, very adamant about um, because good commit messages are really useful when you're trying to track down a problem. Um, people, some AngularJS folks have this really sort of interesting syntax that they have explained in a very verbose Google document through that link. Um, this is the uh, repository for Basha's rebar project where this is the least um, dogmatic and insistent of the restrictions they place on things. But uh, people go to a lot of trouble in their contributor guidelines and making sure that you know exactly how they want their commit messages structured. And so it's a useful thing to be aware of when you're looking at projects on GitHub. Those are both pretty extreme. Generally, you just want to avoid this. These are not helpful commit messages. And I have worked on a lot of projects that end up looking like this. So the, the, issue, the reason you want to keep it short is so that things don't get cut off. And you want to keep it meaningful so that that first line that you see means something good. And then you can add additional lines into the description as needed in order to give enough of a description that you, because you're the one that's most likely going to be looking at this, will be able to understand it down the road. I don't know who said it, but I've heard the quote that the first time you sit down at your computer and write a line of code, you're developing. And as soon as you look away, the next time you look back, you're debugging. The more you can do to leave yourself uh, good clues as to what you were thinking at any given time, the happier we all are. Tags, tag your releases. That's all I have to say about tags. Readmes. Um, an awesome thing that GitHub does when you push a project up, um, as for example this one, is that it has this concept of a readme.md file, md being markdown being that syntax I talked about earlier. If you write a readme document, it actually parses that into HTML and shows it on the front page of your um, repo. And if you click through to another GitHub repository, uh, a markdown document inside GitHub, it will just let you read it as a plain HTML page. So these are actually my slides as a flat file instead of as a um, slide deck. And so the fact that markdown parsing and display and integration is built into GitHub means that if you have just a .txt readme, it actually ends up being a little bit painful to go through that repository because it's just not as readable. And it's really very little overhead. Um, I know, obviously, uh, things like the WordPress plugin repository do require readme.txt. Um, uh, so if you're working on a pure GitHub project, uh, definitely get familiar with Markdown. It's a super nice format, and it'll make your life a lot easier. Um, jQuery is a really good example of a strong readme. They have everything from contributor guidelines to build processes to um, how to get involved, uh, links to other documentation to the jQuery learning sites. Super, super comprehensive, all right on the front page of the, of the uh, GitHub repository. 
Final question about version control is that some things are meant to be versions in something like Git or SVN and others aren't. Uh, source code, configuration files, scripts, sprites and structural images, code dependencies, these are all really smart things to have in your repository because you need them for your application to work. But other things like all of that user media on your site and databases or your entire web root directory, these things probably shouldn't end up going into uh, your repo. Um, the reason is that binary files git works by doing text differences. So it'll have a text file, they'll have plus, 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 line of code, line of code, minus, 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 what you took out, what you took out. You can't do that with an image. You have to store both of them. And that makes the repository size go up really, really fast. The larger the repository size, the slower all of these operations are. You can actually specify particular types of files to ignore. Um, there's a really cool list on uh, GitHub's website of boilerplate git ignore files. There's even one for WordPress that these examples are from. Like those are just parts of a WordPress plugin or a WordPress site that you don't necessarily want to version because it's not relevant to the functionality. Also, wp-config.php, don't put your database password on GitHub. <laughs> Asking for trouble. This is a lot of information. I think these are awesome tools. There's a ton of re uh, resources out there for learning more on them. Um, GitHub provides their own pretty comprehensive help, help site, gives you some quick links. Um, this is actually a screenshot of the top of their page. You can click directly to any of these and they'll explain what that means and how to do it within their website. Bitbucket and most of their competition are doing similar um, help documents. Uh, GitHub goes the extra mile and because their brand is so strong, they do trainings and they have video tutorials and all of that other stuff too so that you can really get the full GitHub experience for learning how to use their tools. Um, it's a very frequently talked about uh, topic. This is of particular interest. There is a webcast for free through O'Reilly early next month um, called GitHub for Designers that I saw an announcement for this afternoon by GitHub's own Julie Hor Horvath. Uh, this is probably going to be a really nice opportunity to see how GitHub works from someone that really knows the tool and works there and is an expert in it. Um, and that's going to be happening next month. So if this has been interesting, but you're still sort of on the fence about how to bring GitHub in particular into your workflow, I would recommend checking that out. Um, and then finally, there's a ton of talk recently about using WordPress for Git. Mark Jaquith has done a lot of posts on using Git to develop against core itself. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that have been, uh, I know Boone gave a talk um, last uh, summer at WordCamp New York about how to use uh, Git and um, Capistrano and do automated developments off of GitHub things. You can sort of take the live staging example one step further by having that live staging, the push to your live staging environment get kicked off just because you pushed up to GitHub. There's ways to register webhooks and as soon as that code's live on GitHub, it goes down to your server and uh, through a continuous integration step and you have instant access to the changes you're making and you can run unit tests and if it breaks, it sends you an email saying it hates you. All of that is really easy to set up using Git's webhook infrastructure. And that's all I got. So, was I on top? So, um, these slides now should theoretically be, they are. Not at the length that I have. It might still be propagating. Uh, GitHub.com GitHub is actually all redirecting to .io these days. So it, it might be a subdomain thing. I'm just reading it off of the server. OK. <laughs> well, it should be up there very soon. And as soon as I've confirmed that it's widely available, I will um, push it up I will to Twitter. Five minutes for questions? Yeah. Oh. Um, you can reach out to me through Twitter. Um, I'm also available at, let's just do this thing. That's my email. So, um, any questions about Git, GitHub, version control, how to send messages saying you've broken something? Okay, well, thank you all for coming, and uh, I'll be around if anyone does have anything.